second lecture now on modern methods uh, of uh, finite temperature thermal field theory. Okay, good. So, um, so let's. Uh, so, yesterday we kind of saw how one gets going by in, when one is trying to find a phase transition in some simple scalar field model. And what we um, found out at the end of the day was that one then computes like an effective potential and one can compute it at three level and then one can start computing corrections. And so in particular we saw that the, the three level and the one loop, that's a simple expression in principle. This is the tree level for my potential with the symmetry breaking. And then there was the one loop correction, which is then, uh, maybe I write it here, which one cannot give analytically, but it, it's, a, it's an integral. And it's an integral over then a free energy density. Where my epsilon k was the energy of something, and this something is now has an effective mass squared, and the effective mass squared was the and the effective mass squared is then the three level mass plus some something which includes the shift or the zero mode. So now, so far, so fine. However, um, this expression has problems of several types. And um, one problem that we discussed yesterday briefly is that actually if we find a phase transition, then it's not necessarily convincing that this evidence is not necessarily convincing because in the domain of, um, of phi bar, let's say when we are trying to then minimize this potential and we look at some minimum, then it can turn out that in the domain that we find a minimum, then the, the corrections from different orders are actually of the same magnitude. And then we would really have to question the convergence. Okay, but actually there's even a simpler, uh, even a simpler way of seeing that something is not quite okay. Because, um, okay, here, 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 I have a, here I have the energy. The energy is a square root of this expression, but suppose I take this phi bar, I mean, that, that's anything. And so if I have a symmetry breaking, I can make this, what I call here M effective. It's less negative with the shift than without the shift. Without the shift, it's negative. You have a symmetry breaking. With the shift, it's less negative because there's a positive correction. But still, if, um, if phi bar squared is less than M squared, then this M effective squared is negative. And if the M effective squared is negative, then there is a range of momenta momenta which are smaller than some value. Let's call it K bar. So for these values then when, when the values are such that the k squared doesn't compensate for this negative M effective, then this leads to complex energies, so to say. And if, if my energy is complex, if I put a complex energy here, then this whole potential is complex. 
And that doesn't really make sense uh, because the free energy density is really a real, should be a real number. So there's some, 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 some problem if we try to look at small values of phi bar. And small values of phi bar are important because that's exactly the symmetry breaking we, we thought that we saw. We saw. In the vacuum, we are broken, and we thought that we saw that at high temperatures, the symmetry gets restored. If it gets restored, then phi bar would be zero. Well, zero is, is less than m squared, so something is, is not right. OK, so now, so, so, so really sort of if, if one wants to do a good job, then certainly something is not right with the expression, with this expression. So now, however, I should maybe say in, in parenthesis that, that still you can find many, many papers where basically this expression is evaluated, and then maybe one does something a bit fishy to, or one takes the real part, or I don't know what. And, and surely for many simple things, like some, some model building, just rough estimate, back of the envelope estimate or so, it, it could still give you a reasonable picture. So, so it's, it's, not, it's not like that you couldn't test what comes out from, from this. Many people try that, many people use that in simple estimates. But if we really have then a good model, like let's say the standard model, then we would really like to understand a bit better what's going on. And at least in principle have a method which doesn't have this kind of issues. So that's what I'm aiming at today. And, and to get there now, the first thing is I, I'll, I mentioned yesterday already the, this imaginary time formalism. It's not necessarily the only way to do it, but it's a, it's a very, I think it's a very clean way of, of then finding a controlled approximation. And so now I'll first start by by giving sort of a derivation of this imaginary time pass integral. And then once we have it at hand, then we can use it to to formulate the problem such that we don't have these issues there. OK, so, so how do we do it? Well, so the starting point is Feynman's path integral. Um, we do it now with the field theory. And so Feynman says that if you have some initial field configuration and then you have time evolution here, minus i. I, I will, for the moment, I will keep h bar here it's not so really important for us, and after a while we'll again put h bar to one as usually as we do usually. But I keep it here because there is some point where it's sort of funny to see how h bar appears. Okay, so we start at some time t a from some state, and then there's a time evolution, and then you project onto some other state. And so Feynman says that to get this, you can do a path integral where you integrate from an initial condition, phi a, to a final field, phi b. These are these fixed fields. And then you take um, i over h bar, and then the, um, the action. So the action is then an integral over this interval an integral over volume. And I think I will now write it um, for our simple scalar field for concreteness. This is the Feynman path integral. OK, so now what we need is, is the z. That's what, what we are interested in. And the z is the trace of e to minus beta h hat. And, and yesterday, for a harmonic oscillator, we evaluated this trace in the energy eigenbasis. And that's a good basis if you happen to know the energy eigenstates. But if we take any field theory, any interacting field theory, normally we don't know the energy eigenstates. But we can evaluate this trace in any basis. Trace is independent of the basis. So in particular, I can evaluate this trace now in, in Instead of the energy eigenbasis, I can evaluate it in the eigenbasis of the field operator. So I, I, I take a state, and I take the same state here, and 
to make the analog with the Feynman uh, maximal, I could say that this initial state is phi a, but it's a trace. And in a trace, it's always the same state on the, on the right and on the left. And then I have to integrate over all these possible boundary conditions. So now we see that this is kind of almost the same as this, but not quite. There is i's there, it's real time, here we have beta. But, but we can just do a bit of mathematics, so, so I mean not thinking about the physics maybe for a moment, but just let's look at these expressions. And, 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 and then we, we see that we can actually, if we know this, we can get this by a simple analytic continuation which we call weak rotation, or some weak rotation, maybe there are many w variants of the weak rotation. So, so what we see quite concretely is that suppose I, okay, for simplicity, let's say that I take dA to, to be zero, and then I set I times dB, I times dB to be what beta times h bar. And so if I have h bar here, then it cancels that h bar, and h, h hat times db that becomes my beta. And so that's really what I, that's what I have to do. And so, so now one, one reason why I put this h bar, now you see how the dimensions work, because beta is one over temperature, is one over energy, but h bar that has the dimension of joule times second, so energy times second. So when I multiply that by the two, then this has the units of time. This beta times h bar has the units of time. So it is really like a time. Okay, so, uh, and then I do also, so that's kind of, that means that this is what, so to say, the left-hand side. And then I, now with the left-hand side, I also know what I have to do on the right-hand side. I have to replace the dB, I have to, have to analytically replace it like that, and so, so what I do in practice is then I call i times t, the integration variable here, I call this then tau. And the tau then belongs to the interval from zero to beta h bar. And so maybe we see what then comes out. What comes out, now I take over the Feynman path integral. And, and what I have to now say is that, okay, the initial thing is some configuration, is phi a, and however, the final configuration is the same. So it's not a different phi b, it's the same. So in other words, I have to integrate over fields which satisfy the condition that phi at the end, at beta h bar, is the same as phi at zero. And then I integrate, and then I have 1 over h bar. i times t becomes 2, 0 to beta h bar. Spatial integral remains the same. And then I have here what's left in the Lagrangian, and this I now write, write explicitly, so, so the first term is uh, i times time derivative squared, but that after the analytic continuation becomes, because of the i, it becomes minus one half d to phi squared. And then the second term, the metric has a minus sign when I put the indices down, so it is one, minus one half di phi di phi, and then there is minus the potential. And this object is exactly what we called the Euclidean Lagrangian yesterday. So it's like the normal Lagrangian, but you, you get a minus sign for the double, twice the time derivative, and then you to remove the minus signs, you call it minus the Euclidean Lagrangian. Okay, so 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 that's the Okay, maybe I still write it once more, a bit more nicely. So 
So in other words, z phi is a path integral d phi, and now here is then what we called yesterday the boundary conditions, because we see that we have to take the fields which are periodic, and then now I can put here a minus 1 over h bar, 0 to beta h bar, d to volume d3x, and then the Euclidean Lagrangian. Okay, this is the Euclidean path integral. So, so now we saw a derivation, and we saw why these fields are periodic. These are periodic because we, for the thermal system, we have to take this trace. And the trace, by definition, it forces you to go to the same place back. Okay, good. So now, now we go on with this, and we, um, we are kind of getting in the direction of these problems and to get there, let's look at the propagator that we would get for this system. So what would be the propagator for this phi field? So the propagator comes always from the quadratic part of the, um, of the action. I, maybe I, to simplify the notation a bit, I, I'll just denote this by sort of capital X, integration over everything. So, so in the quadratic part, we have one half d mu phi, d mu phi, that now includes the Euclidean time and the spatial, and then I put there a mass term, and maybe we put here already like the effective mass that we had had anyways then in the system after after the shift. Okay, so so what do we do? So to get the propagator, we go to momentum space, and so so now in this. In this system, then, we, we, we represent the dependence on the x on the to and x as uh, with these Matsubara modes for the, for the time, because it's a com compact period, so it's a discrete set of Matsubara modes, and then the case, and then phi k e i k dot x. It's, it's a bit tedious to always write this t, sum, and integral. So, um, so actually, often one then abbreviates this a bit, and we write this type of sum integral. We write it as a integral sum k. That's a bit nicer way of writing this. Okay, so, so that's what I do. I'll, I'll, I'll represent these fields as um, one sum integral over k, another sum integral over q. And then I have one half, and then I put here phi q. Then I take my square brackets, and then I put phi k. I kind of pull these fields apart, and then let's, let's see what's left over. Here I have the effective mass squared, and then I have these guys. And so this operates on the right, on this one. So it gives i times, because it's a derivative, and there's an i in the, in the Fourier, then it gives i times k. And then this operates on the left, it gives i times q dot. And then, And then what? And then I forgot. I didn't write yet the exponent. So this was the Fourier. So there is one i q dot x, and then there's another from the k plus k dot x. Okay. And then I I carry out the integral. And as usual, this is some Dirac delta. I I think for us, I, I will I will write like de delta slash. This means that it's the Dirac four-dimensional Dirac delta, but with some normalization factors, which for the moment are not not so important for us. But it's it's the Dirac delta of of this guy, and so then I can also carry out the integral, some integral over Q, and so 
So, so therefore, my part of my Euclidean action, the quadratic part, is then some integral over k, one half. And because of this Dirac delta, I can replace q by minus k. So phi minus k, phi k. And then here is, here is i, and here is i, that's minus 1. But then there's q, but the q is minus k. So in total, it's minus minus k squared. So plus k squared, plus k squared, plus m effective squared, and plus k squared is omega n squared plus the spatial momentum squared. And so from this, then we get the propagator. The propagator is the inverse, and so the propagator, if you have a propagator, it's then, uh, again, there's, uh, the momenta have to be, they have a constraint, and then it's the inverse. Okay, so, so far so fine. Now, now we have to kind of slow down and come back to these problems. And, um, and, and, and we, have to, we have to ask, I mean, where, where, where are these problems visible in, in this expression, for instance, in this propagator? So now the problems, um, the problem, the problems, the problem is an what we what we call an infrared problem. And one way to say what infrared means is that it, it is associated with, it concerns small, small values of of this m effective squared. Well, a particular example was when m f squared becomes negative. Then we had this complex part, that's a problem. The other problem I had, I, I mentioned that, that, that the consecutive orders of the expansion are of the same order. Actually, that happens already when the M effective is positive. It's just enough that it's small enough. Now, <coughs> um, and maybe I can say it like that, even though I haven't really proven it, but Effectively, it means that this m effect, well, that m effective squared absolute value is much less than than the, than the thermal scale. In fact, it's much less than than my Matsubara modes. That's really the domain where I see. Uh, if I take the naive expression, I see a large dependence on this guy, and the large dependence is worrying. It leads to a complex part, or, to, or it leads to bad convergence, and so. So, so that's the domain that some, something goes wrong, where something goes wrong. Now, there is a physics, um, this was all kind of math mathematical, there is a physics, physics reason and the physics reason is a very good reason, it's, it's, it's just Bose enhancement. means that if you have if you have the Bose distribution with some energy then if this energy is much less than let's say pi times t okay maybe i should as a reminder maybe i can i can write the Bose distribution is e to beta times Epsilon, I write it now epsilon over temperature, so it's more clear minus one. 
And so now, okay, usually I write less than pi t or less than 2 pi t. These factors really don't matter. Here you would maybe, maybe write less than t. It's okay. We can write less than t. Anyway, the problem is that if you write this, if this is a small number, then I can, ex then I can tailor expand exponential. Exponential I can always tailor expand. It has no problems like we had yesterday. Exponential converges anywhere. I can tailor expand it. If I tailor expand it, then I have 1 plus ek over t minus 1. And, and further terms, 1 and minus 1 cancels, cancel, and so this is t over epsilon k. And if really this is a small number, then the number of quanta, this measures how many quanta there are of this energy. And this is then a large number. And that's the Bose enhancement, that's the physics that leads to also to Bose condensation. That if you have bosons and they have small energies compared with the temperature, then there are just lots of these quanta. Even if they were interacting weakly, they can still have a large effect because there are so many. And so the Bose condensate, for instance, is a famous phase transition because it takes place even with free bosons. They somehow, the, just the fact that they, there are so many of them that it, it makes it behave in a very um, pathological way, this system. Okay, so that's the, that's the reason. So now, now why, why did we... Um, What can we do about this in the in the <coughs> in the imaginary time formalism? So so it's now an observation, so to say, but it's really a key observation. is that if I'm in the imaginary time, in, um, in the Matsubara, in the imaginary time, there's only a single mode which can possibly be sensitive somehow to these small momenta. Because, because these omega n's, these are discrete. These are these Matsubara modes. And so if I, have a, if I take any omega n, any frequency which is non-zero, then it's not only non-zero, it's large, it's 2 pi t. It's large compared, it's, it's kind of a macroscopic number, so to say. In particular, it's macroscopic compared to the, my, the regime of my mass is where I have a problem. Um, and so, so, so also this Bose enhancement, it really can only come from the zero mode. So in the imaginary type formula, it's only the Matsubara zero mode. Omega n is zero. Can, can display large sensitivity to uh, small M effective. The other ones, they are kind of protected. I mean, the Matsubara mode is non-zero. There is some large number here. So if you make this zero or even slightly negative, it doesn't really matter. It doesn't, there's, no, there's no zero appearing because it's protected by this, as long as this is small compared with that one. Nothing bad happens if you make this small. But if for the zero mode, this is not protected. This is zero. And then this, if this is like negative, there will be a zero, there will be a pole, and so it's already an indication that something goes wrong. So it really is zero mode. Okay, so now, now what, what we do in this kind of a situation where we identify some degree of freedom, which is really the core reason for the trouble that we are having, is that we, 
I mean, okay, we can get depressed, but it's better to just turn the tables. Say that this, this single mode, which causes the problems, it's not, it's not, there's nothing bad about it. In fact, it's, the, it's just essential mode. It's the most important mode, and we kind of promote it to the center stage, and we write an effective field theory for this critical mode. So we write an effective Lagrangian for these modes. And the other modes we integrate out. We, we cannot ignore them. We have to somehow deal with them. But then they, what they do is they influence the couplings of this zero mode. Okay, um, this, um, this procedure is, it can be given a kind of intuitive, intuitive justification if we, if we draw this, this, um, this space time that we have here as a, we can draw it as a, as a torus, because the boundary conditions are periodic. So everything that starts from zero, if I go across the interval, it comes back to the same. So this means that this means that the space time actually in this picture is it looks like that. I have some some spatial dimensions here. But then the time direction is, is really compact. This is, the ta this is the Euclidean time. I can start from somewhere, but if I go to beta h bar, then I really come back to the same, because the fields, all fields take the same value. So it's as if I were living on a torus. And now what we are doing is effectively we take, we have two types of modes. We have the zero mode, which doesn't depend on this, this, this direction at all. It doesn't notice that there is a di di dimension like that. If I have i omega n tau plus i k dot x, if omega n is zero, then it's just, it's a mode which only, dip, only changes in spatial directions, not in the time direction. It doesn't notice that any, there's anything there. Then there are the non-zero modes, and these non-zero modes are some modes which, which are effectively oscillating in this direction. And this we integrate out. And so, so what it corresponds to is that when we effectively we make this, make this torus, we shrink its radius, sort of. We are left over then with an effective theory which doesn't see anymore this extra dimension. It, it lives only in the spatial direction. This is why this procedure is called this procedure is called dimensional reduction because effectively um, we remove one dimension, the Euclidean time direction. And incidentally, dimensional reduction was not. I don't think it was invented in the context of thermal field theory. It was it's a much older concept with the kaluza klein idea of extra dimensions. If we make them small enough, they can also, they are very heavy excitations, can be integrated out, and then we go, go back to our four-dimensional world. In this case, the extra dimensions are some, like, extra spatial dimensions or so, have nothing to do with temperature, but mathematically it's just the same idea, that you have something extra, and then if you look at lo low energy physics, then you don't see excitations in this extra dimension. Okay, so what does it mean now in practice? In practice it means that
in practice it means that I, I, I then replace my, um, so our action, it really becomes now an effective action. And, but I'll first write it like it was. But now we start, okay, so maybe I, okay, maybe I do it another way. Let me first write SE, and then let's make that out of that the S effective. So what happens? So, so first of all, now I, I, I write the theory which only has these zero modes. That's my effective theory. And these zero modes, by definition, they don't depend on tau. So there are no time derivatives like this. This term just drops out. There's nothing like that. I start with the first term. OK, so now I would be tempted to write phi. But really, like in an effective theory, you have to allow then modifications to everything. So actually, the field that I would write, it somehow, it is like the zero mode of the phi, but I should write it with some other mode because it probably gets some kind of wave function corrections and whatnot. So I write it like di phi 3, di phi 3. Then there are other terms. And so now that's then the thing with effective theory that you, in a, in a fundamental theory, we have some principle like renormalizability, which tells us that we only take so and so many operators. In an effective theory, you don't have that a priori. You don't have that freedom. You have to write everything. So you can write a mass term, but this is now some corrected mass term. You can write a coupling, some corrected coupling. And then you have to write basically infinitely many operators. Maybe the first thing comes to mind is some, some, some. Let's call it some coupling um, for sixth power of phi and so forth. Also, derivatives, spatial derivatives, can be added. So infinitely many operators. It's always easy to write, kind of write down the effective theory. And then the problem is really justifying why, why you can truncate it, why at the end of the day you can, you can drop some of this. So perhaps because if you have infinitely many operators, you obviously you didn't win anything. OK, but let's now still write the integration measure. There's the spatial integral. Nothing happens with it. But this, again, gets simplified because nothing here depends on, on the tau. So I can just carry out this integral. It's just a, it's, it, this is constant with respect to tau. So I get beta times h bar. And so, so that's why I, that's one reason why I wanted to keep this h bar because it kind of nicely now then one sees that it's re it's related to this. So what happens? So here we said there are many quanta, and many quanta means that physics should be classical. And here we see it from the equations that physics is classical of these modes because because in the path integral we had minus one over h bar s e now I, when i when I substitute that by this um, as effective, then it becomes minus one over h bar beta h bar times three-dimensional integral of an effective Lagrangian. This I call effective Lagrangian. And so you see that the h bars cancel. So, so it's really like a classical. It's, what is it? It's like a e to minus beta times something. It's like a classical Boltzmann weight. Sometimes we see that when we see 1 over h bar and a four-dimensional integral like here, that we call quantum statistical physics, because there's h bar, there's four dimensions. And then in this limit, when h bars cancel and we have only have three-dimensional integral over the space, that's 
so to say, classical statistical physics because h bar doesn't appear. Okay, good. So, so now that's that's the idea, and and then, however, the important thing is that that these uh, these other modes they they we didn't ignore them. They still appear here. In that, for instance, my my uh, my <coughs> effective mass is not only the mass that I get from the fr from the from the Lagr from the Euclidean Lagrangian, but it also it also gets contributions from I denote by a sort of a dashed line. This is my phi three, but this guy can interact with a non-zero mode. There's a lambda. It's a quartic interaction. So, for instance, I can have a diagram like this, where here in the loop there are non-zero Matsubara modes, and and we can compute their effect, and then they modify the parameter. Actually, I I will do this. This is a very sort of I I want to do like simple but non-trivial concrete computation to show how that it becomes a little bit more uh, like not so mysterious to see that it really is a concrete thing that we are doing. Uh, we, we'll, in a second, we'll do this, this integral. It's a nice little computation. OK, so that's, that's an example of how mass gets corrected, but also the other parameters get corrected. Uh, the coupling gets a correction from two quartic couplings, for instance. This, uh, this is at, at one loop. Well, these are one-loop diagrams. The great strength of this effective series is always that um, we, we try to be very ch ch general. Or we have to be very general. We allow for everything, and then afterwards we compute how, what are these couplings actually, how, how, how large they are. But there's, no, there's no, nothing which says that you should you should stop at this order. If you are not sure about the accuracy of your computation, you can go to higher orders. And so, for instance, you can compute two-loop corrections. And, and it's, it's a very nice a little, little game just to start drawing diagrams. For instance, uh, I could draw a following diagram, two-loop diagram, like this, that I have non-zero modes here, non-zero modes here, but then I have a zero mode here. So is this, should I compute this or should I not compute this if I want to get a two-loop expression for the, for the mass? OK, so you might say that let's do the following. I can redraw this diagram. Let me redraw it like this. I'll, I'll take the external line. And then I take this bubble, and I, I, just, I just put the bubble down here. So I have this kind of a bubble. And then there is this one line here. So I'll, I'll, I'll kind of pull, pull this one line up here. So this is the same diagram. So now it looks like this diagram is really that I computed the one loop correction to the coupling. This is kind of looks like the coupling. And then I'm doing a one loop with the zero mode, sort of one loop within the effective theory. So if that's the case, then I would say that, wait, I should not include this in the mass here because this is rather a loop effect within the effective theory. So that is almost correct, but not completely. And so one has to be really careful. One has to really compute this diagram, because what can happen is that it's true that this is a zero mode, but this can also carry a very la large momentum, spatial momentum. And so there's kind of a part of the phase space where 
this carries a very large spatial momentum, and even if it's a zero mode, still it gives a contribution which does not come if you take this guy and truncate it and then integrate. We always in defect is that we truncate. We, we expand and we cannot handle infinitely many terms, so at some point we truncate and then we integrate. And so there's kind of a change of ordering, ordering of limits issue here. And so actually this, this diagram gives a contribution which partly is taken care of by that, but then there's a rest over, left over which is, which, is, which is here. So we will not go into that, but I just wanted to sh show that it's, on one hand it's something that we, we can proceed to actually any order. On the other hand, it's, it's, it's really non-trivial. It's sort of real like field theory to, to figure out how, how to do it properly and how to account for everything. And, um, and, but once we do that, we have an effective theory and then we can study it with some other means. So I'll come back to that um, in a moment, but maybe we are kind of halfway, so maybe there are some questions now. Hi. So was there any specific reason, reason for you to use uh, the compactification when uh, regularizing the, the action? Or could you, for instance, have done some Toft dimensional uh, regularization or some polyvillers? This is not a regularization. This is, a, this is really like a reduction. And, and the reason, I mean, this, was, this, was a, um, this is a pictorial interpretation for what we do when we, re, when we integrate out the non-zero modes. We integrate out all modes which depend on Tau, and the zero modes which are left over as our degrees of freedom, they live only in three dimensions. Mm -hmm. So just, just an interpret interpretation for that. But now, if you do the computations in practice, we'll come back to that, then you have to, do a, then you have to regularize things, as usual in field theory, and that, that you do whatever di dimensionally. So this dimensional reduction is not the same as dimensional regularization. We'll do in a second dimensional regularization, but it's completely different from dimensional reduction. Okay, okay, thanks. So just out of curiosity, is that a reason why you use the subscript tree for the field in the EFT? Ah, sorry. Yes, very good. Uh, it's because they, these guys live in, in three dimensions. Oh, okay. okay. So, nice. so I call it. This is, again, uh, like the dimensional reduction from four to three. Yeah. Thank you. You can go on. Okay, so before we come, I mean, at the end of the lecture, we'll come back then to what we, once we have the effective theory, what we do with it, how we then learn how the system really behaves. But before we go there, I, I, I just want to show, show you how, how to do this, this kind of a computation practice. So it's, a, it's not very long and it's kind of, it's, it's fun. And it gives you a, an impression of what type of mathematics, if you wish, arise when you do thermal field theory. Okay, so how do we do that? So, so it's a one-loop one loop correction. So you can start by saying we, we are looking at the two-point function and the effect comes from a, from a quartic vertex. So I can put these, these next to each other and then I can count how many contractions there are. There are four fields here. I can contract four times this one. Then I can contract still three times. And then there is a loop. This is then the loop. This is the loop within the vertex. This is really this, this loop here. So out of this comes four times three is three times lambda, and then this loop. And this loop is now my some integral of omega n squared plus k squared, my propagator. Okay. And here I had m effective squared. So now let me be more precise. I, this is not quite correct. Now I, I restore the full notation. And so however, now I have to sum only over non-zero Matsubara modes. 
because that's what we do, non-zero. So omega n, non-zero. And then we do this integral. And, and, and now the, the key point was that this non-zero ones, this is not really important. So to be able to do the computation fully analytically, I'll, I'll omit this, this term. I can put it to zero because this, sh this non-zero must shield us from whatever goes on, on here. OK, so uh, the um, first step is to change the orders of summation and integration. And then we have this sum. And yesterday I showed what this sum is. And actually now it's good to make use of the, what, what we saw yesterday, this sum. We write it in the, in the original form that we got from the harmonic oscillator. But it's not exactly that, because this was the sum over everything. But here I have also only non-zero. So I have to take away the contribution of the zero mode. But that's easy to take away, because if the zero mode is, if it were there, it would give t over k squared. And now it is not there, so I have to just subtract it. So this is what, what we have to do. So now I do something funny, because first I had a sum. Now I eliminated the sum, and now I reintroduce a sum. I write this as a sum. This is a sum uh, 1 over k over t minus, t, t minus 1 is the same as minus 1 minus with a minus argument. And now this is a geometric sum. And so this, what is downstairs starts from n, n0 to something, but there's one of them upstairs, so it's really the sum of n1 to infinity e to minus k n over t. Okay, so so now now we have to then specify the spatial integral. And at and, and this moment, we have to introduce regularization. So I do di dimensional regularization. D for me is um, D for me is like 3, but not exactly, like 3 minus 2 epsilon or something. And then all these terms. And so. I'll maybe take first the sum. Well, but I, ha I must not forget that I did have in front of that, I did have one k, and then the sum minus k n over t, and then plus one half minus t over k. Um, it, it looks kind of crazy, but now, now comes the dimensional regularization to rescue. Because what we learn about dimensional regularization is that whenever you have an integral which doesn't have any scales, then the result is just zero. So one half is just a number. There is no scale. It's nothing. It's, it's a scale-free integral. So in dimensional regularization, this is zero. And likewise, this is zero. But this is not zero. OK, so now, now the integral depends only on the k, k is, OK, maybe I didn't say it. k, small k for me is the absolute value of the vector, of the spatial vector k. So I can go to spherical coordinates. I write this as some, something from the radial directions and then an integral in the, space, in the, in the radial coordinates. It's dd, ddk, so this means uh, this means dk, k to d minus one. 
so that the dimensions are d. d. And then there's 1 over k here, so minus 2, actually. And then I only have to do this one here. Yes? Uh, this also doesn't have any scale, right? It does have a scale. It does have a scale. There's a scale t here. But then there is no scale. You see, because this t you can take in front. You can take it here front. And ah, then there is no scale. Okay. But this t you cannot pull in front. It's there inside the integrand. It's really inherent, inherently there in the integrand. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so, so now I let me write x kn over t. So k is t x over n. So 3 lambda c d k, k to d minus 2. And when I replace k and dk by dx, then I get a factor of t over n and I get it d minus 2, and then I get an additional factor from here, so in total d minus 1. So I get t to d minus 1. But then I have to remember this summation. n to d minus 1. And then integral 0 to infinity dx x to d minus 2 e to minus x. So now, it's nicely, uh, the integral and the sum, they have factorized. And what is this? This is, a, this is a gamma function. Integral e to minus x, x to some power, is a gamma function. In the gamma function, you have like x to z minus 1. So I have to take one of the part of the two is goes into the definition of the gamma function, and this is Euler gamma of d minus 1. And what is this? This is the Riemann, Riemann zeta function. The sum n to d minus 1 is the Riemann zeta, zeta d minus 1. So this is somehow uh, very typical for thermal field. Gammas one gets all the time in field theory. And Riemann zeta, usually one doesn't get in field theory at one loop level. Maybe if you go to higher loops, you might get zetas. But in thermal field theory, zeta is very, very prominent. That, that's, it really comes from this sum. There's always a sum and that gives you the zeta. So it was not very complicated and now we are done. And so, well, almost done. Now we have to put things together. So what we have learned is that the M3 squared is the tree level value plus 3 times lambda times ZD times T to D minus 1 zeta d minus 1, gamma d minus 1. Nice expression. And then we put the Then we put t to 3. And we are lucky because all these expressions, they are completely finite if I put t to 3. So gamma 2 is one factorial, couldn't be simpler. Um, zeta 2 is pi squared over 6. This is t squared. And this is, what is this? Um, we had 2 pi cubed, and then from the, well, this, the surface of a sphere, sphere in three dimensions is 4 pi. 
So 4 divided by 8 is 1 over 2, and then pi over pi is 1, one over 2 pi squared. And so, so let's see if things work. Three times lambda times one over two pi squared, pi squared over six t squared, so t squared over twelve. That's the famous value. That's really the value of this loop. And then times three lambda is minus m squared plus lambda t squared over four. And and this we already saw yesterday. Yesterday we just took this expansion and used it and extracted from it an effective mass. Now we get exactly the same correction by computing this loop with non-zero Matsubara modes. And so so it's, it's correct, that's how it, how it is. And so that's the, the type of game that one can, one, can, one can play and compute these parameters. And then one gets an effective theory, and then we have to do something with effective theory. But so far, we haven't done anything sketchy. There are no, no complex parts, nothing. Everything is well-defined. So now, now, now we'll then kind of change gears a little bit, and, and I'll, I'll now then, well, I, I'll, I'll just kind of also go from this scalar field theory now then uh, directly to, let's say, to the standard model. And there are, okay, L effective for standard model. Before I write down the Lagrangian, maybe sort of two, two additional things that, um, one, two very important additional things that one needs to keep in mind. The first is, the whole point was that we identified these problems to be in the Matsubara zero mode. And the Matsubara zero mode is there for bosons. It corresponds to this Bose enhancement. But for fermions, there is no Matsubara zero mode. And I haven't really explained that carefully here, but for fermions, when you do the same, you derive the imaginary time path integral, then fermions, they have the statistics, they are Grassmann variables. And that's, that means that for fermions, when you take a trace, then actually you don't go to the same, you go to the minus the fermion. It, and this is it's, it's very non, it, you really have to think about it very hard to see how it works exactly. But that's what happens. For fermions, they are not periodic, they're anti-periodic. Anti-periodic means no zero mode. You cannot be constant if you have to go to minus to yourself. You have to change. And so no zero mode. And this means that fermions are all integrated out. And that's kind of really the, in some sense, that's the beauty of this thermal game is that you get completely rid of fermions, and that's an extreme simplification, because in the standard model, the fermions are really the, I mean, for many things, they are the difficult, the hard sector. There's so many of them. They have a lot of structure. But now all of them, you cannot ignore them. You have to integrate over them. But you can do it at one loop or two loop, and if these are maybe technically, I mean, these are even not technically hard computations. Maybe a two loop gets a bit technical, but still very, very straightforward. Can be automatized, has been automatized. It can be done with any model. That's one thing. And then there's another thing which is very interesting as well. Uh, if you look at the gauge field, this was a scalar field, but now let's look at the, at the gauge field. Gauge field is a gauge transformation. We saw that in the standard model lecture. Uh, if I collect the gauge fields 
these are the SU2 gauge fields. If I collect them into a matrix, then the gauge transform matrix is like U A minus uh, U A Q minus one plus okay, whether it's plus or minus depends on sign conventions of the coupling, so I don't remember exactly how it was in the other lecture, but doesn't matter. It's like this. So suppose I'm in a theory which where my fields do not live, they just don't feel the time direction. They are constant in time. Then it follows that if I take a spatial component of the gauge field, sorry, for me, Latin indices are spatial. Maybe I should not call it I, but let's say K. This is a ga gauge field, because if the fields live in uh, spatial dimensions, then also the gauge transformation live in spatial dimensions. And this is a gauge. This is like a gauge field. But if I do it for the zero. Mo zero component for the temporal component of the gauge field, then there is a time derivative here. <laughs> but if the fields don't depend on time, then this term just drops out. It's not there. If the fields don't depend on time, and then the gauge transformations in the effective theory, they don't depend on time, then this term is not there. So get okay, this transformation, and this is not a transformation of a gauge field. This is a transformation of a scalar field. Specifically, this is a scalar in the adjoint representation. So that's another thing which happens is that uh, there is a gauge symmetry, but it's a, it's a bit simpler. It lives in three dimensions. You get additional scalar fields, and you get rid of fermions. And, and, and so, so then I... Now I can write down the effective Lagrangian. And so Okay, uh, and the ordering is now a bit, uh, let's say, arbitrary. But maybe the, maybe maybe it's it's easiest to start with the Higgs. And so the Higgs has the same form as in the in 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 vacuum, but now modified three-dimensional fields, modified couplings, and then additional couplings. Then there are the gauge fields. These are covariant derivatives, just like we've seen in the other lecture, but only the spatial components. So then the gauge fields. Now I'm in Euclidean, so there are no minus signs. It's one um, fourth Fij, Fij for the SU2, for the U1, okay, I could also add gluons. Uh, gluons are not very important because it's really about the, what happens to the Higgs and uh, gauge fields, uh, SU2, U1. Gluons can contribute to some higher dimensional operator or, or indirectly to the couplings, but not very important. Of course, they have to be included for a complete picture. And then I have to also include this, um, the zero mode. So, So I would get... Okay, so it's this adjoint. So okay, so basically, I get if if I use the same notation as this, if this is a covariant derivative in the fundamental, then for the adjoint, I should write it like like this uh, kinetic term, and then some mass corrections because now these are scalar fields; they are not protected. One calls these, maybe one calls these D by masses plus 
and and the same with uh, with the hypercharge hypercharge is particularly simple for the kinetic term and then uh, some other parameter and so forth and so trace uh, sorry d these are spatial d i this is comma this is a commutator yeah Okay, so, and now, and now, now then there are two things, and so the, two things are, sort of state, I write the, what the, just the state is, um, couplings derived, up to well at a two loop level for the standard model and and also many simple extensions thereof and so indeed like there is this there's a, somebody wrote a program where you can easily combine put basically any theory and it derives you all these couplings or the masses and couplings so it's the modern <laughs> way to do the computation carefully once and uh, make an algorithm out of it that then anybody can use it. And then, then you st still have to solve this effective theory. And so now somehow we have, we have kind of postponed the problems. We, we said that there are these problems and then we, we said that let's do the physics which doesn't have these problems and that's constructing this effective theory. But then you still have to face with these problems. Somehow they didn't go anywhere. They, what it then means is that three-dimensional gauge theory, three-dimensional gauge theory, well, this is a gauge plus Higgs theory, it's a very non-trivial system. It is non-trivial in the sense that we say non-trivial in field theory. That means it's interacting, uh, non-Gaussian. Interactions play an important role. Uh, in fact, it is non-perturbative. For many quantities, it's non-perturbative. And, and then it's the usual ga game. What do we do if we have a confining interacting theory? So somebody can do renormalization group or some try some very high order loop computation and then see maybe some patterns of convergence. But in this case, a particularly kind of inviting method these days when we are anyways doing a lot of numerics is that this theory is, is very straightforward to simulate numerically because there are no fermions. It only lives in three dimensions, just bosons. Many of the things which make this theory difficult for analytic computations, these strong interactions, these make it very easy for like numerical simulations. Numerical simulations are often hard if there are correlations between faraway points or so. But if there are strong interactions and everything is kind of local, well correlated, it's easy to simulate. So of course I will not go into these simulations at, at all, but I just say that then you do lattice. It's a topic of its own, lattice simulations for IR physics. This is the ultraviolet part, integrating out the hard modes, then you simulate lattice the infrared modes. And then you, then you find a result. And uh, for the standard model, one often, often plots it like this, that we put here a temperature. And here we put the Higgs mass. Well, today we know the Higgs mass, but uh, Theoretically, we could see what happened if the Higgs mass had been smaller or larger. So we can put here a Higgs mass. And so, indeed, it happens that if the Higgs mass is very small, then there is some hierarchy between some of the couplings, because you may remember that lambda, lambda is sort of g squared over 8 times Higgs mass over W mass in the standard model at tree level. 
And if the Higgs mass were very small compared with the W mass, then this lambda would be kind of a very small number compared with G. And so in this domain, there are like the scalar self-coupling is kind of very different from the gauge coupling. And this kind of a scale hierarchy, actually, it, it, it makes, it helps to make it a first order transition. And so one finds a first order transition. And then when the Higgs mass increases, the couplings become of the same order. And actually, then the transition ends. And so it's just like this phase diagram of water. The axes are a bit different, but there is like somewhere there is 100 GeV here. And then there is like 70 GeV here. And there is the Higgs phase. And here is the phase, sometimes we call it symmetric phase, but some people don't like to talk about symmetries when we talk about gauge symmetry. So sometimes one calls it a confinement phase. But it's not, it's not a QCD confinement. It's the confinement of the SU2, non-abelian SU2, if there is no Higgs mechanism. And then physics is somewhere here. And if we are at the physical value of the Higgs mass, there's nothing. There is what we call then the crossover. One can go continuously from a Higgs-like phase to a confinement-like phase, no phase transition. So, so that's the sto story for the standard model. And so this is, this is then bad, so to say, for cosmology. No first order transition means that there is no deviation from equilibrium. We'll come back to that tomorrow. And deviation from equilibrium is one of the Sakharov conditions. And I think that will be said many times in the next one and a half weeks. And so, so this means this is bad for baryon asymmetry, for instance. Okay, <clears throat> so in the remaining, okay, so, so I mean, this is, it's, it's bad for cosmology, but I think it's important for our, our understanding of the standard model. It, it, it really, a uh, lot of work went into this, and there's no, there's no doubt that this is the picture in the standard model. And so this is really a strong, if you wish, this is a strong, motivation to say that there must be something beyond the standard model. Well, there are many other reasons as well, but this is one of, one of the motivations for saying that, because the baryon asymmetry is, a, is an empirical fact. So, so why, 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 why are we then talking about phase transition, thermal phase transitions when standard model gave this lesson? Well, the reason is that it's it's not too difficult to change this. So this could change, this can change, it's not even a conditional, this can definitely change in BSM. And I'll, I'll give what is probably the simplest example. And the simplest example is we can, even, we can even forget about the gauge fields. Just take a scalar field that we had yesterday. And, and what the, the only thing we need to do is we need to add another scalar field, two scalar fields. Well, many people like to add additional scalar fields anyway. So it's not so bad to play with that. So one scalar field plus another scalar field. Okay. Minus the potential. And now, I particularly nice ways to do, to do it is 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 the following that I take I take. A potential for my this phi is sort of my physical Higgs, but now I now it's just a real scalar, but it represent it would be the physical Higgs if I took a doublet. So for that I don't do anything. I do just like just the same. A negative, so symmetry seems to be broken. 
and then a positive term. So theory is stable, everything is fine. So now I do the same with the other scalar. I put there some mass. I call it capital M chi squared. And then I, I add some quartic coupling, kappa, chi to the fourth. So now they are just two independent scalar fields, but of course then I have to put some interaction. So I put some interaction. So gamma over two, pi squared, chi squared. So now, from today, we have, we have the tools, basically, to see what happens with this theory. So, in particular, I could now, we could construct a dimensionally reduced theory for this. And so, so for instance, then the phi field gets an effective mass, m3 squared, which would be the tree-level mass. And then there is a correction from the non-zero modes, which we computed. This was the lambda, lambda over four uh, t squared. But now I also have to take a cor into account the correction from here, because I can also, I can put this other field here. Let me denote it by a double line. This is my chi, but also non-zero from the chi. So let's let's do phi phi gamma over two phi phi chi chi. We can do two contractions or one contraction. So we get gamma, just a gamma, two cancel seconds to times ten the loop of the chi. But this loop is the what we computed. Chi is also the non-zero modes are not sensitive to the mass, so it gives t squared over twelve. Gamma t squared, so actually it's the best, yeah, so this is gamma t squared over 12. So, so we, we get m3 squared is minus m squared plus 3 lambda plus gamma t squared over 12. And then we can do the same with the, the other scalar. So there, instead of the lambda, lambda the self-coupling is kappa. Gamma is the same. It's here I got an effect on phi from chi, but correspondingly I get an effect on chi from phi, just the opposite, opposite loop. So it's the same. It's actually the same. Same correction. And so what we see from here is that now there are two two different phase transitions. There is one phase transition where this phi symmetry gets restored. Let's call it T phi or T phi squared is, we have, to, we have to equate that to zero. That gives us a fair approximation for the critical temperature of that transition is then 12 um, M squared divided by three lamb la lambda plus gamma, and then there's another phase transition where this other symmetry gets restored or broken depending on which direction you go from. 12 times the capital M squared, three kappa plus gamma. So now, what is the game that we can play with this to get a strong transition? It's, it's sort of a it's a, maybe it's a silly idea, but it's also a very nice idea at the end, and uh, also kind of influential idea. The idea is that we we make not only one transition, but actually we make a we make two transitions out of this.
use the parameters to to let me say to cook up a a two step two step phase transition it looks like this i i put here phi and i put here chi and if I break this, so at, at zero temperature, I want to be here. I want my Higgs wave to be non-zero at the value that it is. It should be. Uh, so in a perturbative language, I, said that I want the electroweak symmetry to be broken. This is where I want to be at T0. But who knows what, where I'm at at high temperature at, or intermediate temperature. At very high temperature, both masses become positive because the, because the Okay, well, then one would have to say something about the couplings, but normally uh, normally I would say that at high enough temperatures, if the coefficient of T squared are positive, then both masses become positive at very high temperature. Actually, it's a very interesting story because one may ask whether gamma, for instance, could be negative, then something interesting can happen. But let's assume that all couplings are positive. Then at very high temperatures, we are here. And so now the idea is that you make this T chi to be larger than T phi. And so this means that the system first goes here. It breaks the chi symmetry. And we don't really care if this transition is weak or strong. It's just some transition. What, what, what we really, really care about is the transition to the hour vacuum. And now this one happens if, if, if the effective potential at our minimum and no chi is deeper than the effective potential where the phi symmetry is restored and the chi is at the minimum. Maybe I should call them with bars to be consistent with what I did before. Then we go there. And so this transition is a transition from one broken phase. It can be very deeply broken to another broken phase can be very deeply broken. And this transition one can really make extremely strong transition, like a huge barrier between these two. So one can really, it can be very, can be very strong. Can be very. <laughs> discontinuous. In fact, one of the issues one has to really worry about is if you play this game, you have to worry that you don't get stuck here forever. That will also be bad, and we don't get back home at the end of the day as we want to. OK, so I think that's, that's enough for today. So, so now we know how, in principle, we can discuss the phase transitions and how things don't work in the standard model, but that's then all the more motivation to look at beyond the standard model. And in the beyond the standard model, it's not at all difficult to find models where you do have a first order transition. And so tomorrow then we, we start discussing how, how one actually, how this transition happens, what, what's the dynamics of this transition, and what we can make out of that. So, yeah, thanks. Thank you, Miko. Thank you, Miko. Okay, so we have time for a few questions. Uh, there's one here. Uh, my question is, is about the, the correction of the mass, right? Uh, of course, you consider just the, the, the correction delivered by the, the another uh, particle. But if you consider kind of corrections by the, the quark top, could it, it uh, kind of ruin this kind of uh, phase transition? Yeah, I mean, so I, I, I want... I wanted to show like a proof of existence that this can happen. But then if you take a concrete model and you, some of the couplings may be known, you have additional degrees of freedom which may be affect one coupling more than the other one, then, then surely in a concrete model it can be that this doesn't work. But I mean, I, I just want to show that it, there, it's not difficult to find models where it can work. 
So first order transitions can be found. Now, in a concrete model, if you really take the standard model and then you put some additional scalar and then the couplings of that additional scalar are somehow constrained by this or that, you put in all the constraints, then it doesn't always work, but it still works. For instance, I believe that if you really take like a singlet scalar couple it to the standard model, then you can find a part of the parameter space where this is not excluded, that this can happen. Okay, but uh, it doesn't work because of the the mass of the other scalar or because of the interaction with, with the, the fermionic mass? With the fermionic mass, I... I mean, because uh, you have uh, contributions to, so to the mass of the Higgs because of the top, quark top, right? Yes. So these contributions could uh, could uh, deliver kind of contributions there. That yeah, I mean, so there, is con there would be contributions here to the top, you from the top you cover, for instance, here. Mm -hmm. uh, so, but then, but you, you know, then you have to say, what does the singlet, so, so suppose the singlet doesn't couple to the fermions, so, so then there are no corrections here. But you still have freedom, I mean, you have this still this coupling, I mean, you still have parameter, and you have freedom here to play with that. I see. There, there's enough freedom to still play with that. Mm -hmm. It's not about one correction, but, I mean, it's... I see. You have enough freedom to play. Great. Thank you very much. Yeah. So you mentioned uh, in the talk that there could be an incident where gamma, uh, the coupling turns negative, one of the coupling, and there could be some interesting implications. So could you mention about Yeah, I, uh, right. I, I, think, I think one can... You, you, that there's this concept of, of inverse symmetry breaking, which is kind of exotic, but it's, it's just a nice... Uh, it's sort of an intriguing concept because usually we are used to the fact that symmetries get broken at low temperature and restored at high temperature. But then I think one can take this model and with some sufficient some tuning of the coupling, making one of them negative, you can arrange things such that actually when you increase the temperature, then the symmetry gets sure. broken at high temperature. But it's a, it's one has to be careful because one has one, one must not make the coupling so negative that the theory would become unstable in some direction. It has to be still stable. And then there are other things like the scalar field theory is always if you really treat them as quantum theories, then then the couplings actually it's somehow the, it, the issue of triviality. So somehow uh, you you must not make the couplings too large, otherwise the theory becomes uh, kind of un, un, this land of, it becomes not well defined very soon. So one has to be very careful, but it's believed that th that it can be arranged that, that at least some at least in some intermediate range, you when you increase the temperature, you actually break the symmetry. That's the inverse symmetry breaking. Yeah. Yeah. Whether one can make physics out of that, that's another question, mm -hmm. and and I think not so much. But there are some ideas that you could that it could also be used for physics, also in the context of baryogenesis. But I'm not. Maybe there's something about it in some other talks. But I uh, yeah. Thank you. What uh, what happens if you add uh, non-normalizable terms to the standard model? Can this help? Uh, yes, uh, yes. I mean, that's one of people have explored all kinds of things, and and just adding some non-normalizable terms is one of the simplest things people looked at, and and for sure you can you can make make it work. Uh, of course, as, you, as usual with the non-renewable as well, you have to be also careful. <laughs> I mean, there are consequences. I mean, you cannot, you must not make the couplings. I mean, usually you get a big effect if you make a coupling large, but then there's a problem somewhere else. So it's always a tricky game with non. You know, if you add one, then you should add all. Then how do you, yeah. how do you uh, adjust the couplings of everything? And uh, yeah. So, but the short answer is yes, you can make it work. Whether it's convincing or aesthetically <laughs> appealing, it's another question. Um, when you wrote down the uh, dimensionally reduced theory, uh, the correction to the mass term was the same as uh, what you'd written down last lecture for the sort of naive... Uh, at, at one loop. Yeah, yeah. Okay, at one yeah. Loop. And, but is there some simple reason to understand why there's no cubic effective cubic term in the... I mean, there would be if you, if you then took this effective theory and, and, and solved it, uh, then, then you started doing perturbation theory with the zero modes. They would regenerate the cubic term. But anything e that... Even in the... La just in the phi to the four theory? Even in, even in the phi to the four okay. theory, yes. Yes. 
anything non-analytic comes from the zero from the dynamics of these zero modes. So you would reproduce those terms if you did then perturbation theory within the effective theory. But that's where, where the problems are. So if you can do something better, you do, you, you'll do something better, and then you avoid the cubic terms if you do a simulation or whatnot. But if you just do perturbation theory in the effective theory, you get these cubic terms. Not only that, but you get, you can get, in some sense, you can get them more precisely because you know a bit about the effective couplings, and then there is also like, yeah, D by screening affects them a little bit. And so, so there are some kind of small things that, that change the picture a little bit, but by and large it's the same, and, and also the same problems. It's non-analytic, you, you have to, you may get this, if you do this perturbation theory within the effective theory, you, you can recover the complex complexity, for instance, in some domain, but in a smaller domain than in the computation I did before. It's partly, partly alleviated the problem, but it doesn't go away completely. So to get it rid of it completely, you really have to do something non-perturbative, like a simulation. In the simulation, there is no, no issue. Everything is real, everything is fine. Okay, yeah. and you mentioned yesterday that the simulations have shown that this is a second order transition, yes. not, not a crossover. So the second order is sort of a... It's for the scalar, it's, it's for the scalar. Yeah. For, the for the gauge, it's really, it, it's a second order only at this single point. Yeah, yeah. yeah and... Uh, yeah. Either first or, or... But if you, if, you, if you omit the gauge fields and just do the scalar field, yeah. this is... This is basically the same, this is the same universality class of, as the 3D Ising model. 3D Ising is, in the statistical physics, probably the most studied model ever. It's known very well, it's a second order, all the critical exponents are known, I don't know, up to five digits or so by dozens of different methods. So very well studied system, a second order for sure. Okay, thanks. More questions? So if not, let's thank Miko again. Thank you. So there's a, there's a coffee break, and then we reconvene at 5 for the discussion session.